Dr. Robert Landavi in Sue for Wine and Science. I'm Claire Hasler Lewis. Uh, and we're thrilled to have such a great uh, crowd here tonight. We're a little bit late because uh, Jean Charles was talking to the students over in the other building and uh, they wouldn't let him go. So, uh, and I can see why after listening to him talk. So, you also will feel the same way, I think, when he's uh, lecturing tonight. We're thrilled to have you tonight. Uh, I know we've been trying to get this date on the calendar for a long time. And uh, here you are, and I know you've brought a number of your wines, which I hope you'll talk about as, in sure. addition to a lot of other things. So I'm going to actually turn it over to Walt Plenz, whom this lectureship is named after. And uh, he's going to do the formal introduction of our speaker tonight. Oh, do you want to use that? Okay. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Doug. I moved up to a microphone first time. Uh, well, before, before I introduce Sean Giles, I, I do need to take a second and thank you, Claire, and your staff, and uh, David, and everyone else for your uh, great support of this, uh, of this event. It just gets, as you can see by the room, it just gets bigger and bigger and more successful. So, uh, so thank you very much. Um, uh, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, Jean Giles Boisse. Uh, I think we first met something over 15 years ago in. Uh, in Scotland, of all places, believe it or not. Uh, not because we were in the whiskey business, at least Behringer, when I was still, Behringer wasn't, I don't think you were either, uh, although you have a broad portfolio, maybe not quite that broad. Uh, but we actually shared a, uh, an importer and distributor in the UK, mm -hmm. and their headquarters right. happened to be in, in Edinburgh. So it was- Good uh, memory. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's getting harder and harder. It was but, the tattoo <laughs> event, you know, the famous- That's right, the famous tattoo event. It, was, yeah. it happened to, it happened, the meeting happened to, uh, coincide with the uh, Edinburgh Festival just by, just by chance, I'm sure. Uh, that they, but it was, a, it was a great event. It was a great opportunity to, to, to meet uh, Jean-Charles uh, at that time and, and have the opportunity to see him several times since then. Um, at that time, I think uh, uh, the, the Boisset portfolio was very focused on French wines, particularly his family's properties in, in uh, Burgundy that went back to the early 60s and, and a growing uh, uh, portfolio in the rest of France. But it did not take uh, John Charles Long to, uh, to turn his sights on uh, California. And uh, I think uh, if you've read the, uh, the introduction, 2003, I think he started his series of acquisitions with the uh, Deloche property in Russian River followed by the Raymond property in Napa Valley and, and, uh, and then the Buena Vista, uh, the historic Buena Vista winery in, in Sonoma as well, plus a number of other brands that he's developed over time. And, and so in just not much more than a decade, uh, 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 Jean Charles has developed a, uh, a real reputation and a, and a deserved reputation within, within the uh, California wine community for a very creative and very innovative marketing, whether it's packaging, so you'll see some of that today, uh, whether it's uh, marketing, and particularly in, uh, in his, in his um, uh, direct-to-consumer interface with the consumer in his tasting room operations, certainly some of the most innovative work that's been, that's been done in the industry. Uh, and he's, he's done all that while retaining you know, a close connection to his uh, traditional roots back in Burgundy as well. Uh, must be a, a difficult challenge. So, you, so the, the, really the question of the day uh, is... Uh, you know, how do you, how do you manage in, in a growing, successful, big uh, wine business across continents, across countries, and across wine cultures as diverse as traditional Burgundy and sort of uh, uh, contemporary, uh, millennial-focused, uh, some of the California wine brands? So without further ado, let me introduce the man who's going to answer that question. I'm sure many others, <laughs> John Charles Boisset. Thank you. Well, wow. I think I, I'm, yes. Well, bonsoir. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us tonight. And a little Burgundian than I am, being introduced tonight by the famous Wild Lens, I need to confess, is a great privilege for several reasons. One, you probably all know, but if you don't, I will remind your memory that Walt has been having a lot of admirers in France, and specifically Burgundy with me, because I had the pleasure to follow his amazing career in the wine world, from both quality to evolution to brilliant marketing, because Walt was one of the few men who created this famous organization, the Behringer Group, and Behringer Blass, and he knows a lot more about cross-continent between Australia and obviously the US and France, because at the time, 
I was very much focused into observing what he was doing because the first time I actually met Walt, he does not remember, I was 25 years old and it was in beautiful Hong Kong. And I was seeing this charming man, he hasn't changed at all, beautiful tie, gorgeous suit, in one of the most prominent house of our common importer, Jepson. Jepson is one of the most powerful family in Hong Kong. He is in multiple business, and Wal did an incredible speech, and I said to myself, one day I want to look exactly like this man <laughs> and be as articulate as I, as I possibly can. And, and it was really, really honestly striking, Walt, and thank you for this introduction. What Wal did in the 90s and 2000s was brilliant from an American perspective and very actually difficult to do, where he created incredible wineries, vineyard projects from all continents, including France. And I remember forever the famous Fleur de Lys adorning one of your bottles with the Rivefort package and, and doing very well in the US. So I think the person who needs a big round of applause is Mr. Wal Klemz. So, you know, I was, um, we were doing a little discussion with many students earlier, so I hope I'm not going to be redundant. I actually have not prepared anything per se, because I thought what we would do is more importantly as well converse. I want to give you a little bit of a background. I was very fortunate to be born 21 years ago only, so I can actually only drink as of tonight. <laughs> in a tiny village. So for some of you who don't relate to what a village is, this is exactly the definition of what terroir is. I was born in a tiny village in Vougeau, which is a huge town, enormous by the amount of grapes we have, but not by the amount of people because we had 176 inhabitants 46 years ago when I was born and we still have 176 inhabitants today. Nobody dies because the wine is so good. <laughs> we have, I think, seven people over 100 years of age in Vougeot, and they're holding strong. One of them is obviously my grandmother. She's 103. And um, a lot of people ask me, what's your grandmother's secret? Two glasses of wine a day. My grandfather lived till 98. My other grandparents till 97, 98. So Patrick, as you who leads marketing and communication, you may have to deal with me for a long time. So I was very fortunate. I want to give you a little bit of a background because I think it's important in the discussion we're having, which is, you know, history, heritage, where we come from. There's a few Chinese and people from Hong Kong in the room, and I encourage a lot of us tonight to think about one of my favorite philosophers, which happens to be Lao Tzu. He said something under the nature that I change a little bit, but think about the source. And this is, I think, what we may want to talk about tonight, the source from all kinds of origin to where we are today. And this is really have what has luckily guided me all my life because I was born in that small village of Vougeau, with the garden being the vineyards, and my parents' home, who fell in love at the age of 18, but more importantly, 17, seven years old, had their first kiss and said, we in Gevray Chambertin, what are we going to do now? And luckily, they started to make wine in the living room. I thought that was a pretty cool idea. Not knowing what to do, my grandparents on both sides were school teachers from history to geography to natural science and kindergarten. So I was raised, obviously, with my grandparents in a very unique environment where the idea of ethic, values, history, respect, is more important. I was raised at the time in France where you were, would write daily the moral question of the day and the ethical thoughts of the day, which I believe is actually quite important in education today to come back again to thinking about the purpose and the reason and the raison d'être. So very fortunately, I, I was born in that environment. So all my life, I was very fortunately educated with the vines because as the playground I would come outside of the house was the grapes. So it's very interesting in a way that it shapes you for the future because early on you learn about the evolution of nature. 
And I want to tell you that because we had a big discussion with our student friends about organic, biodynamic farming, and sustainability. I was very fortunate at the age of three, four, five years old to obviously help making wine in a way, be in the vineyards, but more importantly, to have grandparents and parents who said to me, open your eyes and ask yourself questions of why. It appears at four or five year old, the why question, as I have two lovely twins today who are five years old, um, a very abstract question sometimes. But in those days, it was very important because my grandmother would take me around the vineyards and ask me very critical questions. Why does the earth have worms here and not there? Why is it dry here and not here? Why do we have to put compost on the roses and not? Why are the bees actually you know, producing in this area? How do we make honey? Why are the birds collecting in this specific area of the property? So very early on, I had really the fortune, as many of my friends today in Burgundy, because Burgundy is a very small community, very tight community, of 6,500 producers who really, all of us, went to the same you know, local schools, to the same local church, to the same local sports activity. We all know one another. And what is fascinating is the era I was raised in, which is pretty much, and you may have figured it out, the wine we had was 69 because you know, the more you drink that shape of a number, the better pleasure it gives you. I know we agree with that statement, but I was born in 69, and I was raised consequently in the 70s, which are great years. Years of openness, years where you never close your door in your house, years where your friends were in your house or you would be in theirs. There would not be really in all the villages of Burgundy any boundary. Therefore, there was a cross energy I don't use the term fertilization because we biodynamic and organic, so we don't really necessarily like that. But there was a cross energy between people that learn from one another that transcend to what the region is today. And this is why you know, I got so fortunate to be able not only to learn from my peers, but as well people from the past. And this has been really our focus for the last 40 years in Burgundy as a region and us as a winery, and you're very kind to say, managing two continents, you know, in life, and specifically with wine, the less you manage, the better it becomes. It's maybe often the same for organization, as long as there's great leadership and vision. And I must confess, it has been very exciting for us over the last 30 years to see the evolution of a region. And I will start with Burgundy and what took me to California and how we're doing both is to see a region who had learned from literally nine centuries on doing the same thing, finally questioning the statu quo, finally questioning the forever repetition of what the parents, grandparents have done. And therefore, the 70s and the 80s, after an intensified, you know, pesticides, hardcore, eventually mechanical harvest machines, Burgundy has lived a major pendulum swing to asking the question, why? And we were obviously part of this movement as my sister and I joined the family business 20 years ago. We had the opportunity, the pleasure to really impact who we were thanks to bringing more wineries within our collection, but more importantly, asking the reasons of why do we do every steps of what we do. And how could we, through all the wineries we're very fortunate to have, how could we really manage the concept of terroir to the fullest? So you may wonder, what does he mean by that? Terroir is mainly three things into a dictionary definition, besides the crazy French action on how to say it. The soil, the climate, and the plant and the alchemy of the three creating a better sum than the parts. But there's two other components which are essential. One is the people. Obviously, the people makes the difference and the passion of those people. So how we've created a collection of wineries today from the oldest, 1110, 
to the most recent, actually 1999 with the Domaine de la Vougeray, is really created an amazing collection of phenomenal people. And needless to say, you're all here because you love to be here. We're in an emisic, which is a half circle, the best energy place to congregate and exchange ideas, is the wealth is in people's mind. And what we had the chance to do is bring a collection of wineries, gathering over 20 centuries of history, and bring people together of multiple generations working together to really create electricity, to really create magnetic energy, to really create that je ne sais quoi that makes people give the best of themselves. And it has been really a lot of fun to observe. And I know I may sound to say the obvious, but we went back to the source. Organic farming, biodynamic farming over hundreds and hundreds of acres, building a certification program with the region, encouraging a program called GEST in Burgundy, which is appearing very trivial, but this is a compost program. Can you believe we get together to talk about composting? I could think of more sexy projects. But it was fascinating to do in an era where Burgundy was living intensification, eventually intense clonal selection, which are not actually coming from the terroir itself. So we had to refocus the region. So as we acquired wineries, Bouchard, one of the oldest commercial winery in Burgundy, Jafflin, founded by two brothers, but historically an old convent in Beaune, sellers from the third century when the city was built. Ropito, one of the oldest winery that I think Walt represented through one of his uh, import companies, which is one of the oldest Chardonnay maker, Puligny, Chassagne, Meurceau, Corton, Montrachet. To obviously, you know, Montmessens, to the Clos de Tar, to historical estates. What we've attempted to do in the old world is refocus the energy to what is Im important and essential. In other words, vineyards, passion of people, energy of history, the experience at the wineries, and more importantly, taking everyone as a collection of great minds into attempting to create the best. And that has been really the most fun exercise I think we've done only in Burgundy, in the Beaujolais region, in the Rhone, and in the south of France. And I encourage all of you to come and see us. Now, you may wonder why the US component and how did that come about? The time I met Walt, which was roughly 17 years ago, and then we saw each other again in, in Scotland, I always had the dream for us to attempt to become more bicultural. You know, you get experience through the exchange of cultures. The power of America is this amazing melting pot of colors and religion and everything else that creates an amazing dynamics. If you're born in Burgundy, you think Burgundy. You think that there's the only thing that Burgundy exists. There's only one Chardonnay producer, one Pinot producer, it's us. So I was very fortunate in life. I got to be taken to the US by my grandparents, who were resistant during the Second World War, escaped with American soldiers. I want to thank all of you and obviously your ancestors for that, because as, as I talk to my grandmother almost every other day, still today, I was in Ohio 10 days ago, she was luckily supported as she was an orphan day two by a reverend of Ohio who gave her a dollar every month and helped her sister and her to become who they became. And she always says, you know, always thank our American friends for this amazing evolution of life of what it provided. So in the 80s, they took us to California. And in 1981, I was 11 years old. I had the pleasure to discover California. And the idea for them was to show us the mission. And I don't know if any of you have done it, but you should as a drive from Monterey all the way to Sonoma. So from the middle mission, the first was in San Diego, the middle one was Monterey, and then it finished in Sonoma. We went there, and the point was obviously on history to see where the American, the independence to Mexico was signed in 1846 on the square to 
1850, the Union, joining the Union. And then my grandmother suddenly sees Buena Vista. We were leaving back to France the next day. And she says, well, we might as well see one winery. You kids have been making wine or being part of wine for all your life. Go and see it. So we went. And luckily, and the power of international languages, the lady who welcomed us was uh, from Switzerland, spoke impeccable French. None of us spoke any good English. She gave us a tour that was a paradigm shift for me. I saw this winery. As you have in life epiphany moments, things which changes, like your image of talking at the Jepson estate, like events like the tour of David today of the sustainable winery, I will never forget. I know that. It's going to be registered forever of all the signs I've seen from using all batteries for energy, from the tanks and all that. You will remember it forever. That's brilliant. I saw this winery and I said, Interestingly enough, I was born in a place where we've been learning how to repeat history. I'm in a place where you challenge history. I'm very fortunate today to be sitting in a new nation that is creating the impossible, the American way of life, the American dream through the Count, the founder of Buena Vista in 1857, to the vision of taking the old world to the new world. I said, this is amazing. I could not believe the building I was seeing, the first press house, the second, gravity flow, caves built by the Chinese who had the know-how, to the place that really gave me goosebumps. My grandmother tried the wines. She was a school teacher. She didn't drink a lot of wine, although she lived long, but at least wine in moderation. She bought three bottles that day. We went back on the square. We were sharing a hotel room together. Don't recommend it. Ten days with your grandparents in the same room is a challenge, but that was fun. <laughs> and we tasted those wines, my sister and I, and that was, you know, literally the moment where I thought, this is what I want to do. Amazing. 11 years old, you taste a wine. And why... Am I telling you that today within this wonderful day is because the taste I discovered, I discovered, I did not know that taste, on the Carneros Sonoma Russian River Chardonnay that we had did not exist where I was coming from. I was learned to come from the Taj Mahal, the temple, the Vatican, the mosque, if you wish whatever religion you are, of wine, I did not know this taste. So the next day we flew back, you know, those Pan Am trip where you change in New York for four hours, you arrive in Paris, your parents come and get you, and you six hours drive to Burgundy. So your parents drill you of questions. What did you like? What did you discover? And I said simply to my parents, there's one thing I want to do now or in the future is come back to California and make wine. And it was really, you know, I use the word paradigms because it is a paradigm in life. When you suddenly then have this in mind, it's not, as we say in good French, somewhere else. It's, you know, as an objective. And I think in life, if you define yourself objectives, you attempt to have the discipline to respect them and you work towards them Maybe everything happens for a reason. And it's very funny because I remember forever my mother, who has an amazing palate, is really one of the true talent of wine tasting in the family, says, what attracts you so much behind this amazing country? And my parents were obviously the first one to push for that trip, to encourage it and to believe in the US, is I said, something that can be created, something that could be influenced, something that is not yet existing by the principle of the past but could be altered by the conviction of what we may have for the future. And it was very fun because as we arrived at home, my parents opened a few bottles of wine and said, well, tell me in that morceau, that chassin, what is not in what you've tasted. Pretty cool exercise, right? Specifically when you're 11 years old. My daughters, by the way, are pretty good at swilling wine, I can tell you that. 
they would be here, they would tell you, ooh, it has exotic apple or pear flavor. But I sensed in that glass, and that was my sentence to them, is the dream of creating something that, with the help of the old world, could transcend to something greater than what it is today. And this is really what we've attempted to do. That key moment led for me to obviously study at the American, the French school in Washington, do my baccalaureate, then I went back for graduate studies. But my focus in life, besides other interests, has always been to come back to the US for whatever reason. It could be wine, or it could be anything, for the simple reason that besides even what you see here and what we've attempted to do, is to constantly have an insatian, insatious quest to create. And I was mentioning that earlier today, is the audacity to create is what really makes not only this nation amazing, but any of our future incredible. And to say to ourselves, you know, the dream I have, the imagination, is the only limit to what I can do, is truly the truth. Because I think we can achieve everything. Who would have said that we bought Buena Vista? Who would have said that we bought the Loach? Who would have said that we bought Raymond or Lockwood or Wattle Creek or, you know, et cetera, et cetera? Our vision was to be very focused into attempting to build two worlds in one with the same value and with the same idea. Respect of the past, building for an amazing, amazing heritage, attempting to really understand the map of the future. And this is really what we're trying to do with the Russian River, specifically on Pinot and Chardonnay. We've exchanged earlier with, um, with the Clance family and, and, and Patrick and David in the demonstration winery with all those great tanks. Would it be fun to put the 27 vineyard designate we make at Deloach and see the difference and create the map of the future? What interests us, all of us collectively, we have 950 people only full time within our operation, is basically to constantly search for what we haven't done. And I think it's actually quite fascinating to ask ourselves that question in the oldest consumer products, which was featured on the cover of The Last Supper, right? When you think about it, it's not marshmallows, it's not peanut butter, it's wine. <laughs> and it's certainly not distilled spirits. Maybe water, someone created a miracle at some stage. But wine is the oldest, most exciting elixir the planet has created, and how we constantly reinvent it is the fun of it. So what we did in the US specifically, and that's the question of the Franco-American energy or the Americano-French energy, I believe is the best there is in any organization. You see it in fashion, we see it in hospitality, we see it in the restaurant world, we see it in the perfume industry, we see it in the cosmetic industry, we see it everywhere including wine. When you put an American person or an American spirited person and a French person in the same room, one plus one equals three. To the point that we've even created a wine, my wife and I, which is called number three, which is a blend of Burgundy and Russian River together with our team. And the world said, you're insane. I said, oh, we already know that. Tell me something we don't know. <laughs> you're going beyond the limits. And I could tell you we've only make 250 cases every year. The wine is extremely highly ranked, but besides that, we love to drink it. And it sells out all the time because it represents what the two nations can do. That magnetism between the two is greater than the part. This is what this wine is about. So how we function between our two worlds, to answer more specifically Walt's question, is very simply. We correlate what both have to bring to create that je ne sais quoi that brings greatness, that brings a sense of excellence. So take the winemaking team as an example. 27 of us split on two continents, plus another 15 consulting winemakers without the vineyard teams. We all congregate to ideas and creating, honestly, wine 
that brings opinions from both sides. And the beauty of consulting with someone is you don't have to take the opinion of the person, but at least you hear the opinion. You know, the wealth of any organization, I think, is to be able to collaborate and exchange. It's like asking advice to someone. You ask advice, you run your life, but you don't have to listen to them. But having the wealth to be able to ask someone's <clears throat> opinion or advice or idea is phenomenal. And this is what, in broken English, broken French, what we do with five key core principles. One, if you start in the vineyards, always sustainable. Thousands of acres farm sustainably. And tens and thousands of acres today, I think it would be over 18,000 under contract or long-term contract with growers who we instill to have a similar philosophy as us. Sustainable, organic, biodynamic, if possible. Today, I'm pleased to report that in the Russian River, we've converted a lot of people to follow our philosophy. In Burgundy, even in the 90s, when we started, we're a lot more than we are today. Very important. So the core value for us is the fundamental, the ecosystem. And hence, the wines are better. We all know that wines is made in the vineyards. Yes, we love having a great winery, but the fruit is the essence of what we do. So that's the core principle. Number two, obviously, in the wineries, letting things happen. The most and less technical as we can be, the better it is. And as I know after what we've seen this afternoon, sounds crazy. I think the more we progress in techniques in wine, the more traditional we become. Open top wood for manners, long maceration program, endogenous yeast, uh, no enzymes. Let it be, let it happen, physical touch. Having our people touch. And I think it's what I always encourage in companies. Sometimes I purposely don't answer emails. That's what I say. But why constantly hiding behind emails when we could see each other and specifically spend time? We are lucky to be in a people's business where human interaction creates that additional sum of excitement, that vibration in the glass. So we really believe getting together and being together, that's essential. Third, in anything we do, obviously it sounds very blasé, but a sense of excellence. And more importantly, treating each other as a guest of each other. And very kindly, a few people man mentioned they've been to the wineries and they've seen the great team we have. We feel that wine is no longer, and forgive me to say that, a business in a sense or an industry. I'm the biggest fighter against those words because I don't believe we ourselves work from a recipe or for mapping. And I know it sounds weird to where I stand to say that, but every year a wine needs to vibrate the essence of the year and the calendar that it's producing this wine. So we don't work backwards, we actually work from the harvest to the wine, to the terroir, to the plot, to the vineyards, then to the wine. And that's, I think, very important. And therefore, every one of our team members really create that guest atmosphere. And this is, I think, essential in what we do, whether you're in accounting, in sales ordering, in the warehouse, on the harvest sorting table, we are all guests one another, so somehow attempting in the organization both ways to create that sense of respect. And I think the idea of being bicultural, I think, to answer indirectly a question, is really helping on that. Because people use, as I've seen among you as the students, between the Greek, the German, the Chinese, the Hong Kong, and eventually the, the Turkish, a common language that in English, but a reform of respect. And we believe that's important. Finally, we think that the wine world is evolving into something which is very different than the past. I've actually never believed, personally, that a winery should become that austere cathedral that nobody can preach in. First of all, you know, till terrorism time, all the churches of Europe were open. They could come and pray 
at the time you wished and reflect, look at the architecture, the allegories, and dream and escape and meditate. Sadly, obviously, the previous events that we're living have changed that, but a winery should be the same. And what has been really for us a lot of fun in all the things we've created, whether this is here in the US or in France, is to create an environment where everybody is welcome. And I think that's essential. Whether you call us as a member of our collection to visit Domaine de la Vougeray, which is the most allocated estate we own, at $300 a bottle average, and every bottle is numbered to that, to coming to a larger facility, Raymond, we want you to have a unique experience, and more importantly, take you through the essence of who we are, and open who we are, and allow you to be part of the winery and everywhere in the winery. As you see the pictures going around, specifically Raymond, but Buena Vista, is behind each of every of our winery take you through a story, take you through history for Buena Vista, and really guide people through the education they should have. We think that every of our wineries should be obviously open to the public, and more importantly, the experience should be amazing. And this is why I think we've created something quite different, I believe, in the wine country, because if you take just three wineries as an example, we believe everybody should start at the Ritz-Carlton in San Francisco, where we actually bring the wine country to the city. Quite innovative. We have two wineries in the city, one on Ghirardelli Square, Wattle Creek, and the other one is at JCB at the Ritz-Carlton in the heart of the city, in the old Stockton building, you know, erected in 1912, which creates a great resonance for the people who cannot come to the wine country. But then if you come to the wine country, we have a theme. So why it's quite interesting, whether you're in France or here, we want you to start typically at Buena Vista. This is where it started, 1857. And you to vibrate to the history of wine at large, from Mesopotamia to today, through History Hills, and then go and discover the first press house, and then the second gravity flow building in history. Dive into a museum, into winemaking, into barrel tasting, into winemaking on your own, and bubbles. So each of our wineries is tailored for that. Then we'd love for you to go to Raymond and Napa Valley, so you get a very in-depth education, so 12 experience that you can actually have. That is more, I believe, today than any. Wine and music that we created with someone who is closely associated to you. Uh, winemaking. You get to make your own wine at each of our wineries. So you get to really learn if you're from New York City, Chicago, or Dallas, Texas, and don't really know what is the wine. You get to make it, you get to bottle it, you get to cork it, and you even get to brand it and label it. So you could be your own winemaker. We believe it's very, very important to do that at the same time as the loach to really understand the history of the Russian River and the mini Burgundy that California has given us as an offering of the future and potentially a map of the future. So it's very important that everybody we feel is integrated within the wine world. We don't believe that Napa should become the black card region that you accept it only if you can afford it. We are against in principle that many people promote. That is the antithesis of the old guard of wine that we are from France where everybody is welcome. Everybody should feel, vibrate the energy of wine, whether they could afford it or not. Many people cannot afford the $350 bottle of Cerealist. It doesn't matter. Let's have them buy the $35 bottle of Raymond and dream for the Cerealist or the Red Room. It's not about the purchase, it's about the experience. And that's one, one of the things I believe that sets us apart today in the wine world in a way. Whether we are the wineries, we're on the road, we want to make sure that we create very unique experience. From blending to history to winemaker as creating a play. We're doing a very unique event at Buena Vista if you want to come. It's on December 3rd. It's actually very cool because we've recreated the Count of Buena Vista, the founder of the winery. So everybody in the winery dresses like we are in 1857. You know, the same clothes. 
And many of us speak the same way, and we've recreated the whole family of the Count. The Count, his wife, his sons, one of them, by the way, who created the first Méthode Champenoise wine in the history of California in 1861. And we create events that speaks about the history. We created plays that speak about the history. So we feel you know, the future of wine in many ways, and specifically for all the students here, as I discussed earlier and we exchanged earlier, is as well in how we present the wine world, how we promote the wine world. We think historical marketing is the key. When often, God, this is good. Mm. Ay, 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 ay. Thank you for the crocodile. You know why we have a crocodile here. It's part of Stephanie's collection, I believe. The Count of Buena Vista, after a very unique life, retrieved to Nicaragua in 1867. He basically wanted to challenge Bacardi and make rum. Crosses a river, falls in the river, and gets eaten alive by a crocodile. Tough life, huh? So since then, we created a wine named The Revenge of the Count. <laughs> it's one of the biggest sellers at the winery. It has a beautiful crocodile on the label. So I think Stephanie kindly brought the crocodile to tease me today. <laughs> so we feel, finally, that through all our wineries, there's a very big element of history. We feel we cannot forget where we come from, and we not cannot forget the people who've been with us and before us. And funny enough, that Wal kindly introduces us because the Raymond family worked for four generations at Behringer, even at the time he was, you were running it. Yeah, Roy Jr. Roy Jr. Roy Sr. was married to a Behringer. That's he was right. a Behringer. Yeah. was a Behringer. <laughs> so we need to often, and that's what we believe, and that's why it's very easy for all of us to come back and forth between the old world and the new world, because there is one world of wine in many ways. is one, to follow similar ethic and values. Number two, to defend the world of history. You know, often, and that's where I was going, my Burgundy friends tease me, what the hell are you doing in California? What is Sonoma? They wish in 2003 they've invested, by the way. Because <laughs> today, coming to Napa, even in Bordeaux, when you know, the market is bullish, it's a different issue today to come in Napa than it was years ago when we did. We believed in it. We did not come in for financial reason. We came in through passion, excitement, and a belief. I think if we believe, eventually the rest will come. And that's, I think, the most important issue in the world of wine, is as well to make sure that we, who adore wine, who are part of the wine world, really portray the past as it deserves. The people in 1812 who planted the Russian River, the missions, we're creating wines today from the mission grapes at Buena Vista. We're creating a new wine, which is going to be a huge success, an Angelica. You may wonder, why are you doing that? We're creating 30 different wines with our consulting winemaker, David Ramey, and obviously our winemaker, Brian Maloney, who graduated from Davis, because we want to be the library of wine. The moment we're going to create wine, and this is what I want to leave you with, for financial capitalistic reason, is where I believe we will miss the boat. We've always grown, expanded, and went beyond where we are, not only for the financials. Obviously, it needs to make sense. Obviously, you need to sell something a little more than the price you make it. But I regret sometimes to have spent so much time at university because the world of business is simple. And the beauty is wine is not necessarily about business per se. It's about triggering that passion and making sure, I think at the end of the day, that we pay tribute to all the people that has come before us, enhance their work, add a little bit of what we believe we can, and each generation slowly but surely will create the perfect world. So I think we need to be very proud of California. What we've done so far, I need to tell you, is only the obvious. We have an amazing team. Obviously, Patrick Egan is one of the key leaders of that team. But we've expanded that team. And as looking at Donna 
Everett right now and many of our friends, we went beyond this and we said, and I will close in three minutes, but I need to tell you this story because this is what sets us apart from packaging to winemaking to all the things you know we've done and you can check them on the internet. The most important thing we've done is actually what I've seen all my life in Burgundy. Remember, very humble be background. My parents started in the living room. My bedroom was upstairs. 176 village. Burgundy is not necessarily San Francisco or the Silicon Valley or Napa Valley. It's very scarcely visited except by big collectors and that's it. I've seen all my life my parents and my mother specifically or grandmother opening the door of the house, bringing guests at the dining room table, at the lunch table, tasting the wines and building relationship and friendship. All my life, and this is what the wine world is about, building friendship all around the world. What we've created five years ago is, I believe, from a business standpoint, the most innovative thing we have done. One, we've obviously built a very international business. I call it business, but expression. We, we promote our wines in over 115 countries today. We have built a very diversified collection of wineries from 15 different appellations and region to sparkling wine, red, white, Pinot, Cabernet, to most of the wine varieties. We have a very balanced business with our direct to guests, so receiving people and selling direct. But we were missing one thing, big time. How do we actually, besides dealing with retailers and wholesalers that we love and adore, that are becoming easier and easier to deal with, I'm obviously being facetious, <laughs> is how do we actually bring wine to the people in their home? and do the most fundamental event of anybody's life is education. Without education, tasting, feeling, sensing, and being guided, there's no transcendental moment. What we've elected to do four years ago, actually, is creating what we call an ambassador program, which has never been done in the wine business ever before, is to bring wines to people's homes as simple as that. So we basically calling you and say, would you like to do a tasting? So we decided to and realized early on in 2010, specifically Napa Valley with Raymond, that a lot of people were coming from out of states and a lot of people wanted to live the experience they had with us at the table. We tasting together, we had eight wines, it was phenomenal, I have goosebumps, my left nipple is hard, that happens to me often. <laughs> Forgive me, Walt, for that. You know, we're very emotional people, right? How can I get that at home? My retailer does not do that. I don't even have a retailer of choice. I don't even have a curator of wine. I'm surrounded with grocery stores, and this is the coupon who wins. This is the saving who wins. This is the display who wins. This is the, the discount, the free wines who wins. How am I going to do this? So we said, you know what? That's a great idea. Why don't we come to see you and actually do a tasting in your house or in your restaurant or in a cafe nearby who could accept wine or gather your friends, your book clubs, your knitting clubs, your social club. We'll go to your private club and do it. And I'm very pleased to report that in this room, there's a few ambassadors who created what I believe, I say I this time, I'm not including all of us, I believe is going to become the future of wine. Proximity. Bringing wine into people's mouth in a very simple, democratic, unoffensive, very friendly way where it's exchanging, talking, discussing, feeling, and exchanging about how we feel. It's not how wine should taste, it's how do you like this wine and why you like it. This is the most important one, thing about wine. It's not top down, it's the reverse. So we've created this amazing program four years ago. We have over 1,600 ambassadors 
across the nation, and I'm going to use the example of Donna right now. She's right in front of me. Donna's husband was working in our tasting room. Phenomenal, charismatic man, very charming, extremely good with wine. And Donna, forgive her, was in the water business for Nestle, a company we all know well for years. Water. And she was very charming. I was often in the tasting room talking to people and meeting people because this is where you get your energy. This is thanks to people. And I'm seeing Donna coming, and I said, this lady, we're starting this program. She's got to join. She's got to be part of it. And when we talk about the evolution of the world, and specifically wine, if there's one thing to retain of today, this is exactly this. This is going to be a game changer. Donna ch joined. She said, I cannot sell wine. I was in information technology. I hate selling. I said, Donna, it's not about selling. It's about bringing your friends together and exchanging on wine. How many ambassadors do you have? 204. 204 today. Donna does hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in sales. So if we want to talk business, she started her own business three and a half years ago. She's one of the top in the entire organization and originally did not believe in it. She thought she could not do that because she told me that first day, wine is for the people who studied it, wine is for the people who come from wholesale, restaurant, retail, and whatever else. You know what I said to that? I'm going to ask for forgiveness. I said bullshit. <laughs> bullshit because I come from wine, and that's not the way I speak about it. Yes, we could speak about Anything we want technically, who cares? It's not what it's all about. The wine world will shift, and this is my business proposal to everyone here, is the powers of the world of wine are changing. And luckily, food in America has changed over the last 60 years in a dramatic way. How many times as Europeans we've heard 20 years ago, we cannot eat well in America. Today, we eat probably better in America than in most countries, right? The food world has changed. Not the industry of food. The food world has changed. Restaurants have changed. The food chain has changed to organic, to locals, to all of that. Wine is only starting. So as a conclusion, we are bullish about the wine world. We bullish about the future of America. We bullish about all the wine regions of the US. And more importantly for all of you, check out always a different way to do something. And sometimes it's pretty exciting, and this is what we've done with the Ambassador Program, is actually to do the obvious, is bring a simple bottle of wine, gather six to eight friends, have a nice piece of cheese, a beautiful tomato, Frenchman needs a baguette, so forgive me for that. And just talking about wine and doing what we've been doing for 21st century or 22 centuries, enjoying it, having pleasure in it, and not asking ourselves too much questions. So I was obviously over my time. But you're not done yet. Ah. Tell us what you have brought us to taste. Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> So we, um, we just tasted actually a game changer wine purposely in the history of Burgundy so quickly. 1870, 1880, Burgundy was producing 25% of sparkling wine. Crémant de Bourgogne, very high quality. Then everything shifted to still wines, we realized, and they realized at the time they could actually value still wines more than sparkling. In our cellars, we have Chateau du Clos Vougeot, Bonnemar, Musigny, Meursault, Montrachet sparklings. We decided years ago to reintroduce it. So big game changer in a region which was historically 99% still wine. Today the region is, is, if you're holding to your table, 92% still wine. We anticipate 
that Burgundy may be 85 to 82 percent. Our calculation has a great balance between sparkling and still. Why often are harvest as not as ripe as you know as they should be, and Burgundy stretch from northern Burgundy, Chablis, all the way down to Puy Fusset, Macon area. So unriped grapes, beautiful proponent. This is a blend of Pinot Noir from two vineyards, Bone and Haute Côte de Bone. So this is really honestly one of our most successful sparkling, typically doing very well by the glass in, in the finest restaurants and, and so forth. Small production, however, I believe we make only 12,000 cases of this wine. And I decided to put my initials because I've always dreamt to challenge the Champagne people to show them that we can make better in Burgundy than they can. <laughs> now, it's a fact. <laughs> so afterwards, we're going to try uh, Buena Vista Chardonnay. This is actually, as far as I'm concerned, one of my favorite wine of Sonoma that we produce under $30. This is phenomenal. Long pressing time, Burgundian techniques, um, French oak, collaboration between Brian Maloney, David Ramey, unbelievable vineyards throughout Carneros and Sonoma and a little bit of Sonoma Coast. This is Buena Vista. This is the old packaging that we went back from 1861. Patrick went to the archives, the museum, historical green color, Historical writing, this is really Buena Vista as you knew it when you were alive in the 19th century. <laughs> this is, um, purposely, we wanted to bring you two Pinots for the fun of it. Two Pinots in the $25 to $30 price point, so you could try something that is accessible, not crazy price, from two different worlds. Burgundy Ursuline, founded by the sisters, don't think that women did not have an influence in wine in Burgundy. They did big time. Benedictine Ursuline. I head winery, Boisset, is actually an old convent where women made wine for over 300 years. Hence the name Ursuline. Screw top. We were the first one in 2000 to put a Grand Cru in screw cap, which almost got me killed. <laughs> I escaped to California, luckily. <laughs> But it's very true, we're the first one, obviously, today. The rest is history. Everybody's doing it. But it was a sacrilege. They even took the wheels of my car in front of my house one night. <laughs> true story. It, it was violent. Uh, you know, you're talking to prehistorical mentality in Burgundy. Deloach, Russian River, I think a staple. Brian does an amazing job. Open top for manor, over 20 days long maceration. Um, you know, endogenous yeast, uh, oak age in French barrels from Troncé predominantly. Uh, a great bottle of wine, that's the 2014. Lightly fined, two egg whites clarified. You know, we use egg white for clarification, typically for the winemakers here. So we, we pretty much use egg whites throughout all our red wine making. This we're specifically very proud to show you. Big innovation, the first velvet label in history. <laughs> so you could sleep with it, it's very gentle. <laughs> if you don't have anyone to sleep with, Raymond is always a good friend. <laughs> you see we have the, uh, the red room, which is the most successful room, I believe, in Napa, from what we've been told by the vintners. Um, this is very exciting because here we want to celebrate 40 years of the Raymond family. You get into Raymond, it's about the family. You getting into the cellar, it's about the family. You getting into the vineyard, it's about the family. The Loach, it's about the family. Buena Vista, it's about the count. There's only two labels who carry the Boisset name, that's it, out of 28 different wineries. So very important to know that the ego, even though we may appear to have a lot of it, uh, I'm sure we do, is really on the background the winery is a part of the collection, but it's the history and the family dedication and commitment to quality that is prevailing. And I can tell you, I got a call no later than yesterday from Walter Raymond, who's quite happy about what's going on with Raymond Vineyards. As you could figure out, and, and many of you who know him comes and see us, but um, he helped us and me specifically to recruit Stephanie Putnam, director of winemaking. She's a star. 
Kathy George, 26 years with us, is the assistant winemaker. Thane Knudsen, who graduated from here as well, third assistant, and Philippe Melka Consulting. So two women run Raymond Vineyards. I'm part of the tasting, but you know what happens when you give a woman an advice. They do what they wish anyhow. <laughs> and it's better this way, for sure. So in any case, we wanted you to have a little bit of a we couldn't bring, obviously, the extent of every winery, but just a sampling of wine from $20 to $40 of what we produce, which will give you a good access to uh, an introduction of, of who we are. And finally, uh, Patrick very kindly brought some cards for some tastings. So this is two for one tastings. So please, everyone, take them. Very easy. You show that when you come. You show Patrick's card, and you'll be drinking 1947 Raymond's. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, we'll have to go to Behringer, so I'll have to call Walt. <laughs> it's an easy escape. Huh? But in any case, thank you. Sorry to make you torture. So I always wear red socks. That's a very important factor. And uh, someone asked me earlier, my boxer short does not match the red of my socks. <laughs> and we, we always wear jewelry. Uh, you may wonder why we, we indeed one of the first innovators to actually put jewelry on a bottle of wine, because we feel the bottle of wine is like a gorgeous lady. She needs to be adorned and love, and she deserves the best. So we started to design jewelry over the last five years, and the highest-end wine we, we possibly can produce, it's called the Surrealist, 2,400 bottles uh, produced from Napa Valley. It's a Cabernet Petit Verdot with a very big part of Petit Verdot. Uh, is actually adorned with the jewelry, and the whole idea is for our guests to use the bottle as a decanter, and we use it and keep the memory of the wines. Again, Marketing-wise, we want to build that experience of, again, reusing, first reduce, reduce and recycle. So that follows the three R principle. And more importantly, people as well use it. My daughters, if you open our fridge, I told you I have twins of five years old. The bottles are lemonade, orange juice, milk, water, everything. So you could use the bottle however you want. That's the beauty of it. I've bored everybody to death. You see. So what recommendation would you make for upcoming graduates from UC Davis who are passionate about going into the wine industry? Call us immediately. <laughs> One, uh, thank you for saying that. So the question is, what recommendation would we make? You know, we all graduated. Um, I believe school is very important, of course. Um, Although I spent a lot of my parents' money, who were very generous to offer me my schools, I spent way too much time at school. Luckily, I was always living in the winery and being part of it. I would recommend joining ASAP, accepting to do any job possible. And more importantly, start from the ground. You could be graduate, PhD, who cares? I could have five degrees Honestly, forgive my colloquialism, who gives a crap? Understand it from the basics. Understand the sales process immediately, even if you're a winemaker. There's no winemaker today who is not articulate. And as we discussed, part of the whole process. The wine world is wine world, whatever the function. And be audacious, be daring, and be loyal. Very important. You judge, I think, a winemaker, if we talk about winemaker throughout time, not through one vintage because they get lucky. We get lucky once, maybe twice, but it's by being consistent, being loyal, being faithful, being committed. But I would say, dare to go. And if you cannot find a job, do something else that you never thought of. I love when people come as winemakers. Tyson is one of them. I want to be in the winemaking side. Great. Why? The gentleman is one of the most charming you can find. A smile like this, remembers everybody's name, 
beautiful eyes, incredible contacts. He's one of our most successful front of the house today. So don't come as well with the preconceived ideas of always where you want to be because life is going to take you where you eventually should be. It's a long way to answer. <laughs> yes, you left me earlier. <laughs> so how has social media changed your business? Wow, that's a great question for a marketing guru. <laughs> you want to answer? I think you should. Wow. I'm yes. not the expert on that one. And, and by the way, I'm an expert on nothing. You know my favorite expression? He's an expert. He's someone who knows. Someone huh? wrong with authority. Yes, who knows how to be wrong with authority. <laughs> <laughs> so I could have answered that Patrick is the expert. Well, I would say, what would I say? I would say that uh, uh, we, we adore it because it's exciting. I should stand so you can see. Uh, because it's, it's maybe, you know, the wine world, uh, even 30 years ago, was controlled by a few people. We were having a discussion earlier in the session about Robert Parker, right? There was, there was a sort of a, a certain insular world of gatekeepers that controlled entry into the wine world. And, and today, social media is allowing all of our guests who are passionate about wine, the way they don't shop describe, to connect yeah. and build those stories and to share it together. So it's shifted the world from a few people telling us what to drink to everybody sharing their own stories and their own histories. And so anytime we can build relationships that way, as we've done... Uh, through Donna and, and her group and, and things like that, we, we adore it. So for us, it's democratizing the world of wine. That's yeah. right. The key word I would just uh, repeat in a different way is sharing. You know, sharing an experience. Nobody, you know, we understand the fact that Guru needed to be here at some stage to guide us to understand categories and what wine is. A lot of that has been done already. You know, we drink nine liters of wine in the U.S., 26 in Germany, 26 in the UK, 60 in France, I could go on and on. Not enough in Japan, three, not enough in China yet. The key is to share and to make sure that people see wine in every kind of environment. And that's why I love social media. You could be on a boat, you could be in a bar, you could be having a pizza, you could be not even having food, you could be having sushi, you could be having Thai food. You could be touring, you could be in a museum, you could be designing a dress as a fashion designer, you have a glass of wine. And I think it's making sure that wine, thanks to social media, becomes that ultimate elixir which is part of society, part of the history, part of the heritage, and part of who we are. So I think social media is really helping us to broaden this field. We have a lot of people commenting on our, the JCB social page that this is cool. You gave me an idea to do that. So enlightening people, giving them ideas, bringing them a certain level of imagination and having access to them, more importantly. That's the cool part of it is if we're good at it, if, we, if one is good at it, one can have access and bring people in that community. And that's so fun. You know, for me, the, the most fun in the wine world is when someone says, I want to buy a glass. It's not just selling a container or two. It's immaterial what you sell. It's to see on someone's face a smile. And thanks to social media, you have that one-to-one -one where someone tells you, God, I had this new presentation. I had this wine. You're making this amazing rosé from Provence on tap. It's available at... Uh, Anchor and Hope in San Francisco, and I just had a glass. This was fresh and crisp, as if I tasted it in the winery in France. Can I dream of a better comment? That makes us a smile like that. That's social media interaction as well. Mr. PhD. <laughs> Double PhD, right? Wow. Uh, Congratulations. Do you think that Napa and Sonoma are Typecasting themselves as Cabernet, Chardonnay, and Well, that's a, an excellent question in a sense. So if you look at the history of France as a parallel, right, bring the French background to it, we could bring in Italy, Italy, which is more recent, but France, Loire Valley is Cabernet Franc, a little bit of Pinot, Chenin. Burgundy is Pinot, Chardonnay. Bordeaux is Cabernet, Merlot, Bordeaux, Variety, Sauvignon, Sémillon. Right, so every region has the ability to focus and have the discipline to be what the best they are at. 
I genuinely feel it's a big challenge to produce certain types of Chardonnay in Napa. And I genuinely believe it's challenging to produce certain types of Pinot in Napa. So I believe it's not necessarily pigeon, pigeon holding yourself, it's attempting to become the best at what you do. Napa is 47,000 acres. Only a third of that is Cabernet. There's a lot of Merlot, there's a lot of other things. You know, it's a small region. It's the same size of Burgundy, when you think about it. So it's very small. So at some stage, Napa is 6 million cases of Cabernet. We should eventually, at some stage, focus. And I think the focus is important. Now, you could be like region like Beaujolais. Should Beaujolais migrate from Gamay to Syrah? That's a very interesting question. Have we done Gamay for 200 years? Is it really still appropriate on that soil with the climate evolution? Should we make more serious, less fruity, more powerful wine? If and should Beaujolais change its pruning techniques from Goblet, you know, like this, to Guyot, which is what we're doing? That's a very interesting case study. I think that's a UC Davis, Harvard Business School case study because I think Beaujolais has finally understood that the osmosis between the soil, the, the, the rootstock, and eventually the pruning technique should not necessarily be what it is today. That's a huge shift. So that's even a bigger question. I just think what you know, Napa and Sonoma are doing is great. You know, time will tell. We'll continue to craft and be better at what we do. The beauty of a capitalistic system and a market economy, it keeps the great things and it eliminates the things which are not as popular. And over time, we know that Cabernet is amazing in Napa. I mean, taste the level. If you were to plot the success of Napa Valley versus the outside of the first growth of Bordeaux, Napa is killing Bordeaux. Take 14 Chateau out of the equation. 14, or let's say 12. Let's take even Iken out, right? So take Cabernet, Cabernet from Merlot Bays out. You take second to fifth. You do the equation of the average price per bottle, the quality of wine consistency. I believe Napa kills it. So I think I'm a huge proponent of Napa cabs and, and the beautiful expression. Sonoma, luckily, is four times bigger. So we have a great diversity, which is a wealth that we should market, and we need to become better at marketing Sonoma Valley versus Russian River, Sonoma Coast, Carne Rose, you know, Dry Creek, which we are doing petit à petit. So I think my view is California is the best place. It's only the beginning, and we're going to continue to make it evolve, thanks to the great wines we're all making. And one thing I want to leave you with is, I don't think California has made as great wines as now. Everyone. It's so exciting. You know, remember when I was tasting one in the 70s, in my teens, early, late, you know, you tasted bad wines. Right, Wild? There was bad wine on the shelf today. Very difficult to find worldwide. So, but Napa Sonoma will rule, okay. I think. Fair, thank you. Thank you so much. So let's go taste some wine. Let's drink some wine a little bit. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well.